Hello, I'm Marites Vito. Welcome to Southeast Asia Speaks. This is a show where I get to interview resource persons and newsmakers on issues affecting the region. I will be speaking to Mark Clifford, a journalist who served as editor-in-chief of the English language papers in Hong Kong, The Standard, and the South China Morning Post. He's a former board member at Next Digital, the media group owned by Jimmy Lai, who is now in jail. And Mark is the author of the recently released book, Today Hong Kong, Tomorrow the World, What China's Crackdown Reveals About Its Plans to End Freedom Everywhere. Mark will be talking to us about Beijing's repression of Hong Kong and what happened to Apple Daily and what all this means for us in the region and the Philippines as well. He's joining us from New York and to our, our viewers, you can send questions via Facebook. And thank you so much, Mark, for making time for this interview. Well, thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to, to be here with you. Yes, of course, uh, as journalists, you know, we're very interested in what happened to Apple Daily. And uh, please, can you share us briefly the story and why China decided to crush uh, this 26-year-old publication? Yeah, well, I think as as you know, Mary Tess, uh, in on July first, uh, twenty twenty, uh, China imposed a, a far-reaching uh, national security law that basically made any criticism of the government uh, subject to very severe punishment. Uh, the next month, in August, uh, police about two hundred police raided the Apple Daily headquarters and uh, took away Jimmy Lai. Uh, the uh, the chief operator, the chief executive officer, and the chief operating officer, they were released. But you know, it was clearly a warning to us that uh, things were not going to be easy under the new regime. Not that they had ever been easy. I mean, there was an advertising boycott, a lot of pressure. I'm sure you're familiar with some of these issues. But things sort of went along. However, Jimmy Lai was put in jail on some other charges uh, a few months later. In May the following year. His assets were fro his his shares in the company were frozen. The government tried to uh, seize and freeze three bank accounts, overseas bank accounts in Singapore, and uh, we said, "Okay, we're going to carry on. Nothing to do with us. He's not running the company. He's not trading his shares. We will just continue business as normal." Um, I guess the government decided that wasn't the answer they wanted to hear because in June last year, so less than a year ago, um, they sent five hundred and fifty armed police into the Apple Daily headquarters, treated the place like it was a crime scene, uh, terrorized journalists, uh, took a lot of um, materials, and took away staff. So at this point, uh, we have seven people in jail, including Jimmy Lai. Um, other than Jimmy, who's uh, been convicted on a civil disobedience charge, none of the rest of them have been tried, let alone convicted. So they've been in jail for the better part of a year, just sitting there, uh, in complete violation of the promises that Beijing uh, made to Hong Kong uh, in terms of, of freedom. Uh, the government went further than that and froze the bank accounts of three of our key operating subsidiaries, uh, including the newspaper. What that meant is that we couldn't pay our 600 journalists, and the net result was the following week. Uh, we couldn't pay the electricity, we couldn't pay the phone bills, we couldn't pay anything. And uh, we were forced to um, uh, print our last edition. We printed a million copies uh, in a city of uh, eight and a half million people and sold them out instantly. I mean, I think Apple had been a very popular newspaper for 26 years. The journalists there were doing the same thing those last days that they'd been doing for 26 years. But Beijing decided to criminalize criticism, criminalize dissent. And it unfortunately was a, a major blow, the sign of much worse to come in Hong Kong. And since then, we've seen other publications close, a whole raft of, of NGOs, civil society organizations just uh, fold up. How about so. you, Mark? Yeah, were you threatened? Uh, you're, you're with, you were a member of the board, so did they threaten you as well? Um, well, luckily I was, uh, the, first, the first time that they had the raid in August uh, 2020, uh, I was the only um, director in Hong Kong who was not in police custody. So it was a little bit unnerving. Um, but uh, I personally was not threatened uh, directly. I've been indirectly threatened under the national security law. And just today, um, the communist newspaper in Hong Kong, Wen Wei Bo, uh, said that I was a CIA agent and they had pictures of me with a bunch of people who I don't even know 
uh, supposedly part of a big uh, conspiracy against China. So that's not really a very comfortable feeling. Yes. Uh, how about Jimmy Lai? I mean, I know that you're in the U.S. and he's in jail in Hong Kong. Is he able to send messages or at least communicate to the world, to the rest who want to, to know what's happening to him? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a good question. I exchanged some letters with him and then I thought, well, I'm probably causing him more trouble than um, than it's worth because the, under this national security law, even writing a postcard to somebody like me could could be construed to be illegal under the national security law. So my understanding um, is that uh, he's holding up as well as he can. But think about this. He's a 74 year old man, devout Roman Catholic, always preached peace. He also happens to be diabetic. And he's in a maximum security prison in solitary confinement. Every every time he has to make a court appearance, he's they put him in, in manacle chains, 30, 35 pounds of metal chains to humiliate him and try to break him. And again, this is a 74-year-old guy who's never done anything violent in his life. Okay, uh, let's talk about your book, Mark, because it's quite an exciting book. Maybe you can show it. <laughs> Because it's not available here, at least the hard copy. Yes. Oh, yeah, and so. it was just released early this year, right? Yeah, uh, February 1st, so just a month ago. Yeah. And then interesting that you argue that what is happening in Hong Kong can be a blueprint for China to use against democratic society. So that's quite alarming. Do you see this happening now? And maybe talk to us about it. Yeah, I mean, look, Hong Kong is is part of uh, China's sovereign territory, but the way that the crackdown has occurred in in Hong Kong, I think, uh, is a sort of blueprint that, of course, the Chinese want to use for Taiwan, but in other democratic societies as well. I was just in Scotland last week, and uh, there's bullying of Hong Kong uh, students by the United Front and Chinese Communist Party linked organizations trying to get students to disavow democracy. There's pressure put on local politicians, Scottish politicians, not to host or, or attend a, a National Day uh, party for Taiwan. Uh, we've seen the case of, of Sweden, where um, the Chinese ambassador is, is uh, bullying Swedish journalists because they're trying to get a, one of their own citizens out of jail in China. Um, Norway was punished for giving the Nobel Peace Prize to uh, Liu Xiaobo, a Chinese dissident who sadly passed away, died in Chinese custody um, seven years after he got the, the award. China just kept the pressure up on Norway for seven long years, only until Liu Xiaobo died did it ease off. Australia had the, the temerity in, in the Chinese eyes to, um, to ask for an investigation into the origins of COVID. Now, the Chinese say they want to know where COVID came from. I think the whole world would like to know. But somehow, the fact that the Australian prime minister asked for a, a, a genuine investigation was enough for China to lash out, say that it wouldn't buy a, a range of agricultural products, beef, barley, wine from Australia. It, it kept buying iron ore that it needed. I think in the Philippines, you've seen, you're very well aware of the sort of bullying that goes on and the, the shutting off of agricultural exports to China when your government does something to protect its own territorial integrity. So I think China's using a, a combination of economic power. And, you know, this is a big economy, $14 trillion, $15 trillion, second largest in the world. They're not afraid to throw around their economic muscle, but they couple that with a coercive, bullying um, attitude towards countries that are doing things that they don't like. So could be Taiwan, could be Tibet, could be Hong Kong. They're trying to draw... Uh, trying to draw red lines about what we in free open societies can do and uh, who we can meet with and where we can do it. And and I think that's wrong. And unfortunately, China's red lines are just becoming um, more and more pronounced and encompassing more and more areas. So uh, based on your research and what you've written, what lessons can let the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries learn from uh, China's playbook, what it has done to Hong Kong. Yeah, well, I think one thing is that uh, one needs to be, you know, very have as much transparency and openness as possible in government, so that we can see, uh, and in business, we can see uh, where the where the money is flowing. Um, I see. I think we see in all economies we have, and we saw this interestingly with Russia and London. We're seeing this now. We have a lot of enablers, a lot of people who are 
singing China's tune because they have an economic interest to do so. So I think hold your politicians to account, hold your business people to account, be as open as possible and try to build alliances. I think one of the um, one of the lessons that we're seeing coming out of the, the horrible situation in Ukraine is that open societies realize they can't just sort of drift along and let the Xi Jinping's and the Vladimir Putin's uh, vision of the world uh, prevail. And I think in Hong Kong, you know, is is really it's a clash of values more than anything else. And unfortunately, we're seeing that clash of values uh, particularly prominently played out in Southeast Asia. You mentioned uh, Ukraine, which is really timely, Mark. Uh, I was going to ask you later, but maybe I can put in the question now. Uh, there is some analysis that this Russia's invasion of Ukraine emboldens China. And, you know, it's getting some people nervous. Will they do the same to Taiwan? Or at, if it's not Taiwan, uh, maybe they'll be more aggressive, let's say, in the South China Sea. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's a great question. We're all watching. Uh, certainly China's watching what is uh, going on there. I think that China has been counting on the world uh, just as Xi Jinping has you know, presided over horrible abuses in Xinjiang, where we have the largest internment of a civil population since the Nazi period. Uh, obviously, very bad things have happened in Tibet in recent decades. And, and then in Hong Kong, you mentioned the South China Sea. I mean, Xi Jinping told U.S. President Obama in the Rose Garden at the White House in 2015 that he would not militarize the South China Sea. Turned around and did it. Paid no price for it. So I think China has thought, hey, we just, you know, it's like salami slicing. Slice a little bit here, a little bit there. Pretty soon we have what we want. I think that they were hoping that the world would, you know, be horrified when they took over Taiwan, but would ultimately accept it just as the world accepted um, Hitler's annexation of of Austria in 1938, the Anschluss. I mean, everybody was upset, but nobody did anything. I think the great, if there is one silver lining in the Ukraine situation, I think it's that uh, the response of, of countries that Xi Jinping sees as uh, kind of decrepit, decaying, decadent democracies are, um, are in fact capable of standing up when they need to. And I think it really heightens the, the need to, to stand up for freedom, but it also heightens the need for companies, for countries to have common cause with each other. I mean, countries that are threatened by China, countries that are open societies, democracies, people who believe in freedom, um, need to need to stick together and realize that uh, uh, they, they could throw their lot in where they've got to eventually choose. It's either China or the U.S. I'm sorry, because that's not the world that I worked for for 30 years and you know implicitly believed in, in greater cooperation, integration, globalization. Unfortunately, it hasn't worked out. Yes, and uh, here in the Philippines, uh, on May 9, we will be having our presidential election. And uh, the South China maritime dispute, our dispute with China, is one of the issues, although it's not a main campaign issue here. And of course, China would like to see a president who is friendly to them. Any thoughts you have on how China interferes in democratic elections of other countries. I know this is not covered in your book, but with your experience uh, having lived in Hong Kong. Yeah, well, I mean, in Hong Kong, but also in places like Taiwan, and even we're now finding out in the, in the UK, um, they they sometimes, uh, say in the case of Taiwan or in, in Hong Kong, had secret ownership of, of media companies, publishers, um, in more open societies that are not quite under their control as much like the UK. It turns out that they've been funding UK, secretly funding UK lawmakers. Same thing in Australia. So I think we're seeing hidden influence. Um, we're also seeing uh, the, the United Front, which is the above ground uh, arm of the Communist Party, working in open societies ostensibly for things like combating Asian hate a against Asian racism. I mean, who would be against that? And uh, yet we had a rally uh, recently in London uh, that um, featured, uh, it was an anti-Asian hate rally. Some Hong Kongers came and started preaching democracy slogans. They got beaten up by other Asians, by mainland Chinese. So you can see that this was, you know, I, I knew about this rally going in, that it was really the United Front organizing it. And so you're seeing them infiltrate organizations, community organizations in the UK, ones that get government uh, money. They play a long game. And uh, I think we have to be really alert to it. At the same time, 
we, we have to be really careful. This is not about the Chinese people. It's about the Chinese Communist Party and its influence on open society. So how do we balance this, this need to welcome immigrants from, from everywhere with the need to also be conscious of um, you know, undue improper influence in, in our politics? Yeah, it's interesting, uh, the cases you mentioned. So apart from this, inf because we're really focused on this information from China, and it's very difficult to track down funding for candidates. So, but in your experience, is their main weapon disinformation or it's all of the above? I, I think it's all of the above. I mean, they, they really like uh, paying for people and helping sponsor them and just ensuring that they will... They'll do their bidding in soft ways or hard ways. And uh, again, I think that I think England is, is really a country to watch, be, or I should say Great Britain, um, because the influence of Russia has been really strong there. They called it Londongrad. I mean, there were so many uh, Russian billionaires living there and they had a really corrupting influence on uh, on law firms, investment banks, uh, the housing market. And of course, now that's all being called into question. But I think we see in a lesser form uh, similar things happening with with um, the Chinese Communist Party in, in London. So um, it's an all of the above. I don't know that China is quite as advanced with disinformation as as Russia is, but um, you know, obviously they're very, yeah, you know, they're very adept at, at sowing discord and, and divisions. So one final question for you, Mark, and this is one of the suggestions you put up in, put out in your book is you urge businesses to reduce dependence on China. Here in the Philippines, we look at it as our great source of investment and trade. So how does, uh, how do we balance this? Um, what do we watch out for when doing business with China? Yeah, I, I, that's a really difficult question. Again, I think we can look to Taiwan for some of the answers to that because Taiwan has gone through various periods. Um, it's a little bit cyclical, but uh, uh, often when they're a DPP, when the, uh, the former opposition is in power, they tend to have go south programs or, or you know, look south um, so that they reduce their dependence on China. Look, it's tough. I mean, it's a really big market, but uh, I th and, you know, some companies have made money. A lot of companies have lost money. I mean, it's a it's a really sad situation because um, globalization in many ways was such a force for good. And if we are going to have to start decoupling and and, you know, if we're not looking at China, well, are we looking to India? Are we, is ASEAN doing more? Is we're we going to have a kind of a new uh, kind of East Asian co-prosperity co sphere that doesn't include China, that goes from India to Japan? I'm not really sure I know, but clearly the the linkages have primarily been through through China in the last 30 years. And I they're, they're not going to be cut overnight. I mean, I, you know, sincerely hope that it doesn't come to any total decoupling um, you know, let alone a conflict. But it would just seem to me wise for countries and companies to have a little bit more of an insurance policy. I mean, we saw with the, the pandemic, um, you know, being really reliant on one supplier and, and given difficulties of supply chains made companies and societies very vulnerable. And I think we need to look at more resilience, more resilience to protect against things like pandemics and more resilience to protect against political uh, upheavals of the sort that we're obviously seeing now in Russia, but if anything serious happens with China, it will be you know, much, much more serious. So thank you so much, Mark. But I'd like to remind our viewers and listeners to try to get hold of your book today, Hong Kong, Tomorrow the World. I've started to read it. It's actually uh, an easy read, but a painful subject. So thank you so much. And we hope to continue this conversation in the future. So good day and, and bye. And thanks again. Good day. Bye. Thanks so much. And look forward to doing it in person next time, either in Manila or in New York. Yes. Okay. See you then. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.